This is a reading from the Diary of Jesus by Jean Olagnier. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Susanna and Salome ran over to the tomb. They saw a great light streaming out of the opening. They drew near and saw a creature. Matthew 28, verse 3. His face shone like lightning, and his garments were white as snow, so that the guards trembled for fear of him and became as dead men. But the angel said openly to the women, You need not be afraid. I am the angel of divine grief. Matthew chapter 28, verse 5b. I know well that you have come to look for Jesus of Nazareth, the man who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, as he told you. Come and see the place where the Lord was buried. You must go in haste and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And now he is going on before you into Galilee, where you shall see him. That is my message to you. The two women fell with their faces to the ground. They got up, terrified, and ran away. They would calm down some time later and go back to the Eucharist room. They would cry and pray, but would not tell anyone for the time being. Meanwhile, Peter and John set off, followed by Mary of Magdala. John chapter 20, verse 4. The men began running side by side, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He looked in and saw the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter, coming up after him, went into the tomb and saw the strips of linen lying there, and also the veil which had been put over Jesus' head, not lying with the strips. The veil had been neatly tucked away in a corner, with the actual shroud carefully rolled up inside of the veil. John 20, verse 8. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. He saw, and he believed, that Jesus was risen from the dead. But... He apparently thought that he would never again see Jesus on earth. As for Peter and Mary of Magdala, they thought that the body had been stolen. All three were deeply discouraged. That is why John wrote in his Gospel, John 20, verse 9, they had not yet mastered what was written of Jesus, that he was to rise from the dead. The disciples returned home, but Mary of Magdala stood outside the tomb, weeping, and she bent down, still weeping, and looked into the tomb. She saw two angels, clothed in white, sitting there, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. These were the angel of divine grief and the angel of the Lord's life in the flesh. John 20, verse 13, the angel said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Because they have carried away my Lord, she said, and I do not know where they have taken him. After saying this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. She was too upset to recognize him. John twenty fifteen, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? She supposed that it must be the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you have carried him off, tell me where you have put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which means master. At this, she threw herself in front of Jesus. But Jesus said, Do not touch me. I have not yet gone up to my father's side in these garments. Footnote 28. Holy Mary, who was the most pure, was the only one worthy of touching her son before he returned to his father. But return to my brethren and tell them this. I am going up to the one who is my father, and your father who is my God and your God, and I shall come to them. John 20.18. So Mary of Magdala brought news to the two disciples of how she had seen the Lord, and he had spoken thus to her. At this point, Mary of Clopas, Martha, and Johanna ran in out of breath. They said that they too had seen the two angels and that they were asked to inform the disciples that the Lord had risen. Peter thought this over and shook his head. Both he and John doubted the women's story. Then Susanna and Salome came out of hiding and dared to tell what they had seen. This did not make things any easier for Peter. The guards were like dead at first, when then they revived. Two angels had appeared, and now just one, and he no longer would come back, but was sending them to Galilee. In short, the two apostles were more and more skeptical. Mary Salome and Mary of Clopas began to doubt their own sanity and headed back to the tomb. They came back beaming with joy. This time they said they had seen the Lord, and he said, Go tell my brethren to go to Galilee in a few days. Matthew 28, verse 10e. They shall see me there. 
it was, it was not until the Blessed Virgin herself said that she had seen the risen Lord that Peter stopped denying the fact. He then felt it was urgent to tell all the others, to let all the others know. Meanwhile, Matthew 28, verse 11b, some of the guards came into the city. They said that Jesus was risen from the dead. The news of his resurrection spread like wildfire. The guards then, Matthew 28, 11c, told the chief priests of all that happened. These gathered with the elders to take counsel and offered a rich bribe to the soldiers. Let this, they said, be your tale. His disciples came by at night and stole him away while we were asleep. We were just lying when we said he was risen from the dead because we were afraid of being punished. If this should come to the ears of the governor, we will satisfy him and see that no harm comes to you. The soldiers took the bribe and did as they were instructed. By then, Joseph of Arimathea had most likely heard that Jesus was risen from the dead, so he hurried over to the tomb which was on his own estate near Golgotha. He picked up the precious shrouds so that no one would desecrate them. Footnote 29 Joseph took the clean shroud in which Jesus had been wrapped. It had been found rolled up inside the veil. Joseph also took the soiled sheet in which Jesus was lowered from the cross and brought to the tomb. Joseph would entrust all these to Lazarus, because Lazarus was still in a favor with Rome. Jesus' enemies would never dare to go to Bethany to desecrate the shrouds or take any other drastic measures. Around 9 a.m., Jesus appeared to Lazarus. Philip had just arrived in Bethany. Jesus asked his, friends, his friend Lazarus to tell the brethren to go at once to the Eucharist room. Once again, Lazarus was asked to stay home. It must have been around about 10 a.m. when Johanna was graced with a visit from the Lord. Manan, meanwhile, had left Bethany with the shepherds in obedience to the Lord. He then parted from the shepherds. About 11 a.m., Manan, Joseph, and Nicodemus saw the Lord with great joy at Nicodemus's home. Even Plautina and the other Roman ladies who had been at Golgotha were graced with Jesus' visit some time in the morning. The whole group of shepherds also met the Lord about noon on their way from Bethany. The Lord arranged to meet them in a few days in Galilee. Finally, the disciples of Emmaus saw the Lord late in the afternoon. Luke 24, 15. They were still conversing and debating together when Jesus himself drew near and began to walk beside them. But their eyes were held fast, so that they could not recognize him. These were Simon and Clopas, the son of Clopas, the former chief of the synagogue. The latter had just died on the night of the Last Supper. There was a great deal of excitement at the Eucharistic house, as people continued to come and go. Plautina, a group of Roman ladies, Longinus the Centurion, and a Roman soldier came to visit Mary. They wanted her to instruct them as a mother, until the apostles would allow them to say that they belonged to Jesus. Only the apostles had not yet been graced with the presence of the risen one. They were the only ones who had failed to be with him on the abominable way of the cross. Since they felt humiliated, they remained silent, especially when Martha spoke up. She had not said anything until then, but admitted that she too had seen Jesus. He had told Martha that he would be waiting for the hour of her death to carry out their mystical wedding. The ten apostles felt increasingly humbled. Footnote 30 this sense of shame was good for the apostles. It would enable them to become better spiritual fathers. At last, quite a while after supper, Jesus appeared to his apostles. He said to them, Luke 24, verse 36, C, Peace be to you. It is myself. Do not be afraid. But they cowered down, full of terror, thinking they were seeing a ghost. What? He said to them. Are you dismayed? Why do such thoughts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, to be assured that it is myself. Touch me and look. A spirit has no flesh and bones as you see that I have. And as he was saying this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Then, while they were still doubtful and bewildered with joy, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? So they put before him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he took these and ate in their presence and gave them the remains. Jesus then showed them how much he trusted them. He reminded them of their attitudes during his Calvary. He did not do this to make them feel guilty, but rather to show them the power of his love and forgiveness. In spite of what they had done, he could forgive them. This humiliating and cruel trial they had gone through was going to strengthen them. John 20, verse 22b. With that, 
he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. When you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. When you hold them bound, they are held bound. He went on to say, I still have many things to tell you. I will tell you when the one missing is back. Pray for him. He meant Thomas, of course. He left as he had come. The day of Jesus' resurrection came to an end. April 8th till May 16th, Jesus was going to appear to people many times in his tangible, glorious body until the day of his ascension. He did this to complete the instruction of his apostles. They would always regret having abandoned the Son of God at the crucial time of his passion and death. They would always regret having doubted him. Jesus showed them how this would continually give them the humility required of the servants of the Lord. Indeed, there was only one way they could be Christ's successors and lead his living church. There was only one way they could give a vibrant faith witness to the Father's justice. They had to be humble always and be filled with an exhaustible love which God would give them in his mercy. April 8th to 11th. To begin with, the apostles waited for Thomas and prayed. Meanwhile, Elijah the shepherd went to the cave where Jesus was born, as he used to do at times. He found Thomas lying there and weeping. April 12th, Friday. Then Thomas and Elijah went to the Eucharist room. They only had to wait for Jesus now. April 14th, Sunday. Jesus came once again unexpectedly. They were having supper in the Eucharist room. John 20, 26b. The disciples were indoors and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. Jesus came and stood in their midst. Peace be to you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, who still doubted, Let me have your finger. See, here are my hands. Let me have your hand. Put it into my side. Cease your doubting and believe. Thomas answered, You are my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You have come to believe, Thomas, because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The risen Christ summarized his whole teaching point by point in the dazzling light of the resurrection. He would spend the whole night with them. On the preceding Sunday, they had all received the effusion of the Holy Spirit. Even Thomas received it, although he was not with the others. Jesus explained that this was the first mysterious result of his new grace. They had been baptized in the fire of love, and this washed them of every sin. After this, they could fully perform their priesthood. As the sun dropped below the horizon, Jesus left his apostles for a while after the meal. He told them that he would meet them in Gethsemane. Then Jesus spent some time with his mother in her room. It was nearly midnight when Jesus went over to see his apostles. April 15th, Monday. Jesus took them to the place of his agony. There he explained to them what had happened. Since the three apostles did not have God's help, they were unable to stay awake on their own. Yet they thought they were the three strongest apostles. Peter had sworn he would die with Jesus, and the sons of Zebedee had sworn on March 26 that they would drink of Jesus' cup. This showed that the apostles were unable to do anything without God's assistance. After this, Jesus took his apostles up to the Galileans' field. He once more commented on the Our Father for them. When you say, Our Father, always remember that I am in the Father, and that my love for you was so great that I willingly died for you. See the fulfillment of the Father's kingdom as really practicing God's law and my word. See to it you do the Father's will to the end, as I have done myself. Always see the daily bread as faith, hope, and love, obedience, and humility. When it comes to forgive and to be forgiven, remember the sliver in the eye and the plank. This applies to you more than anyone else, because you have abandoned me, and yet will have to remit sins. As for resisting temptation, keep in mind the blessed. The precious stones on their crowns are the temptations they overcame. Finally, you will be freed from evil only if you call on the Father's help. The Lord again left his apostles for a while. The sun had already risen. He told them to meet him later in the morning on Golgotha. As the apostles climbed up Golgotha, they faced the hot, dry sun. John revealed to them everything about the torments Jesus felt carrying the cross and during his crucifixion. John did not spare any details. Hearing this, the other apostles grieved even more for having abandoned Jesus. 
Once they reached the top of Golgotha, the only thing they wanted to do was pray. Together they said the Our Father. After this, Jesus met with them for a short time. He said, Those who remain in me will not be harmed by the evil one. Jesus then told John and Simon to accompany the Galilean women back home. Lazarus would provide a carriage. The Lord said that he would meet his apostles at Mount Tabor. The eleven asked, Are you leaving us, Lord? He replied that he would see them in the Eucharist room that very evening. On the way back from Golgotha, various people insulted them for their cowardliness. When Jesus appeared to them in the evening, he said that being insulted would make them more humble and remorseful. April 16th, Tuesday. Despite Jesus' passion and resurrection, a number of people of goodwill found it difficult to believe in him. These people had been tempted by Satan through the chief priests and their minions. Jesus made one final attempt to persuade these people of goodwill by appearing to an impressive number of them simultaneously. He appeared all over Palestine, from the Decapolis to Caesarea Philippi, Sidon, and, Gish and Gishkala. He even healed some people and called a dead man back to life. Jesus also asked all those who were able to tell his disciples who were gathered on Mount Tabor to pray of his appearances. April 17th to the 24th, a continuous stream of people flowed over to Mount Tabor to tell the disciples that the Lord had appeared to them on that wondrous day, Tuesday the 16th. Meanwhile, other worthy believers were graced with an appearance from Jesus. Jesus obviously did not appear to everyone. The appearances so far have always been to those who loved him. He comforted the most afflicted, especially Analea's mother and Judas's mother. He also appeared to Mary of Jacob, his hostess in Ephraim, to Syntyche in Antioch, to Yehokana's farmers at Esdralon. In Giscala, however, Jesus appeared to a group of rabbis who had specifically come all the way there to deny his resurrection. He stared daggers at them, with his arms stretched out as if on the cross, and they ran away terrified. This occurred near Hillel's tomb. About this time, Jesus appeared to some of his apostles who had just arrived in Galilee. They were hoping to sell some fish to make a living on their own. They did not want to impose on the ones who were gathering on Mount Tabor. John 21 verse 1 Jesus appeared to his disciples again afterwards at the Sea of Tiberias, and this is how he appeared to them. They were gathered at night on the shore. John 21 verse 2 Simon Peter was there, and with him were Thomas, who is also called Didymus, and Nathaniel Bartholomew from Cana of Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two more of his disciples, Andrew and Simon. Simon Peter told them, I'm going out fishing. They said, We are coming with you. So they went out and boarded the ship, and all that night they caught nothing. But when morning came, there was Jesus standing on the shore. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Most likely they failed to recognize Jesus because it was slightly foggy that morning. Footnote 31. The author makes the connection between the fog and the disciples' failure to recognize Jesus, while Maria Valtorta only mentions the fog. On other occasions, the disciples failed to recognize Jesus after his resurrection, even when there was no fog. See, for instance, Luke 24, verse 16, editor. John 21, verse 5, Jesus asked them, Hey, have you caught anything, my friends? When they answered him, No, he said to them, Cast to the right side of the boat, and you will have a catch. So they cast the net and found before long that they had no strength to haul it in. Such a shoal of fish was in it. At this, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Simon Peter, hearing him say it was the Lord, girded up his fisherman's coat, which, which was all he wore, and sprang into the sea. The other disciples followed in the boat. They were not far from land, only about a hundred yards away, dragging their catch and the net behind them. So they went to shore and found a charcoal fire made there with fish and bread cooking on it. Bring some of the fish you have caught, Jesus said to them. Simon Peter, going on board, hauled in the net to land. It was loaded with great fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And with all the number the net had not broken, Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. As was his custom, Jesus offered the food, blessed it, and distributed it. After this, he told Peter that it was time to get Margium and bring him to Mount Tabor. John 21, verse 14. This was the third time that Jesus appeared to his apostles after he was risen from the dead. And when they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you care for me more than these others? Yes, Lord, he told him. You know well that I love you. 
he said to him, Feed my lambs. And again a second time he asked him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you care for me? Yes, Lord, he told him, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my yearlings. Then he asked him a third question, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was deeply moved when he was asked the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You can tell that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Then Jesus said, You have told me three times that you love me. This erases your having disowned me three times. Put on the pontiff's robes and show forth the holiness of the Lord in the midst of my flock. John 21, verse 18. Believe me when I tell you this. As a young man, you would gird yourself and walk where you wanted. But when you have grown old, you shall stretch out your hands, and another will gird you, and carry you where you do not want to go. So much, he told him, prophesying the death by which he was to glorify God. And with that, he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw the, the disciple whom Jesus loved following him. This is the same one who had leaned on Jesus' breast at supper and asked, Lord, who is it who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked Jesus, And what of this man, Lord? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he should wait till I come, what is it to you? You follow me. Then they all knelt down. Jesus blessed them and dismissed them, saying he would soon appear on Mount Tabor. He also said it would be good if they, the leaders of the flock, prayed and let the disciples come and fish for them. April 27th, Saturday. On Mount Tabor, Jesus appeared to about 500 people, not counting children. It was early in the morning. All the apostles were there, as well as, as, well as all the shepherd disciples, Manaean, Marxian, and Jonathan, whom Cusa had to fire because of Herod. Many of the 72 were present as well. These were the first disciples Jesus had sent on missions. Finally, Stephen, the former disciple of Gamaliel, was there too, and many other faithful had gathered there from all over Palestine. Actually, Peter explained to Jesus that there should have many more, there should have many more of them. When people came and said they had seen the Lord, many had left immediately, hoping to see him too. Jesus said that he was disappointed that the others did not obey his command to wait for him and pray. Then he described what his church would be like. It would be structured with a hierarchy. It would be united and brotherly under the leadership of Peter and his successors. Love would always be the prime consideration. Do as I did, he said. I knew that Judas would do those horrible things, but I still did everything I could to save him. He is the one who did not want to be saved. He listened only to Satan. Remember my sufferings, because now you know how weak you are. Remain humble. Be content with what, gives, what God gives you. After this, he told most of them to come to Bethany, twenty days before Pentecost, that is, for the second Passover. Footnote 32. See the book of Numbers, chapter 9, verse 10, FF. This would take place on the eve of Er. He then arranged to meet his apostles and those of the 72 who were present the next day at dawn. These were to become the future priests of his church. April 28th, Sunday. Jesus and his little group met in the morning. They sat in the shade of a grove near Nazareth. Jesus instituted the seven sacraments and commented on them. On, on the same occasion, he also spoke for a long time about welcoming pagans. You know, he said that I do not ex that I did not exclude them, and you must do everything I did. Do not demand too much of them. It is enough if they have faith and obey my word. They will be circumcised in heart and spirit. Do not despise the uncircumcised. As for heresies, combat them with all your strength, but try to bring the heretics back to the Lord, and do not forget that Christ's passion continues in Christians. All of you are the members of one body. He also told them to elect a new apostle to replace Judas. Finally, he urged them to be faithful and come to the meeting that was to take place in Bethany. At that, he left. May 5th, Sunday. On ER 14, there was a huge crowd in Bethany, but the Lord still had not come by sunset. Peter then exhorted the faithful to return to the city. After they left, Mary of Magdala told Peter that Jesus had asked Lazarus that the meal be prepared Gethsemane, 
Let us remember that this was Lazarus's property. The eleven, Lazarus and his sisters, the women disciples, the shepherds, and many of the seventy-two went to the olive plantation. Mark, the steward's son, took them by a shortcut to the new wall recently built around the Garden of Olives. Footnote 33. Soon after Jesus' resurrection, Lazarus had a wall built around his estate, the olive plantation. He did, he did this so that no one would profane the place where Jesus had undergone his agony. Joseph of Arimathea did the same for his orchard, where the tomb was located. As soon as they all sat down, Jesus appeared. He greeted his mother, then the others. He walked over the ta- to the table where Margzim was seated, and the second Passover meal began. Matthias, the shepherd, presided at the table. He began singing the hymns, said the ritual word, and filled the cup. Jesus prepared the food, giving the best pieces to Margzim. At key moments, Peter reported what Jesus had done. Then, at the Last Supper, he described the blessing of the cup, the washing of the feet, and the Eucharistic sacrifice. After this, Jesus told Peter and his cousin James to break a loaf of bread and to fill the largest available cup with wine. Jesus stretched his hands over the bread and wine and prayed silently. Then he said, Distribute this bread and share this brotherly cup. Every time you do this, do it in memory of me. While Peter and James obeyed, Jesus brought the Eucharist to his mother. When the Eucharist was over, they prayed and Jesus left. May 6th to 15th. The apostles and the disciples did not go far from Jerusalem. Jesus appeared quite frequently to one or the other in order to complete his teaching. Every day he also appeared to his mother. He asked her to gather everyone at Gethsemane. May 16th, Thursday. A large group of followers were gathered on the appointed day. At the crack of dawn, Jesus and Mary walked quietly, gazing at one another in love. The spouse of God and the Son of God communicated alone, soul to soul for the last time on earth, removed from the rest of humanity. When the sun rose, they could hear the apostles speaking in the distance, Jesus and Mary had to part. Mother and son kissed one another again and again, blessing one another. Then Mary knelt. God, God her son, put his hands on her head and blessed her in the name of the Holy Trinity. Then he kissed her on the forehead one last time as he lifted her back on her feet. The crowd of followers waited for the Lord on the hill between Jerusalem and Bethany. Jesus spent some time alone with the eleven. He desired once more to share a loaf with them. He thus ate one last meal with them, with Peter and his cousin James on either side of him. After this, Acts chapter 1 verse 4a, Jesus gave them orders not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the fulfillment of the Father's promise. This would take place in the Eucharistic house. At Jesus' request, Lazarus had given it to the new church. Mary was also going to live there for a while. Meanwhile, Jesus said, you will prepare for this. You will pray with the seventy-two under the Virgin Mother's leadership. God was murdered in Jerusalem, so the new temple must rise in Jerusalem with the Holy Spirit. It shall stay there until Jerusalem repudiates it as it repudiated me. Only then will it be up to you to set up the seat of the church elsewhere. She is God's beloved and must not perish. Her heartbeats must make it to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 1 verse 4b. You have heard of the Father's promise, Jesus said, from my own lips. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And Jesus' apostles asked him, Lord, do you mean to restore the kingdom of Israel here and now? But he told them, It is not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Enough for you that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will receive strength from him and be my witnesses in Jerusalem and throughout Judea and Samaria. Yes, and to the ends of the earth. Matthew 28:19. You must therefore you therefore must go out making disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the commandments which I have given you. And behold, I am with you through all the days that are coming until the consummation of the world. After this, Jesus told his apostles that Peter was going to be the only visible leader of the church and his cousin James, the leader of the Assembly of Jerusalem. Throughout this last meeting, Jesus stressed the need for his apostles to be pure and holy. 
He exhorted them to love one another. He reminded them that if they were filled with charity, they would be able to do anything God required of them and to overcome any obstacle. Jesus embraced them one last time. John sobbed on Jesus' chest and begged of him, Give us your bread now to strengthen us. The Lord obliged. He took a loaf, blessed it, and broke it, saying the ritual words. He did the same with the wine. After this, Jesus went over to the crowd waiting for him. Upon his request, Mark had gathered them at the Galilean's field. All of his own were present, including Manan, Joseph, and Nicodemus, Stephen, and Margzim. He gave Margzim the new name of Marshall as a sign of his future destiny, evangelizing barbarian lands. Jesus had most of his followers stop in a half circle around him. The disciples held them back as he went further up the hill. By then, they were already near Bethany, overlooking Jerusalem. His mother, the apostles, Lazarus, the shepherds, and Margzim came along with him. Jesus climbed on a large rock and opened his arms once more as to embrace all of them. Once more he gave his commandment, Go in my name and evangelize all the pagans to the ends of the earth. God be with you. May his love comfort you and may his light guide you. May his peace remain in you until you enter eternal life. Acts chapter 1 verse 9. When he had said this, they saw him lifted up, and a cloud caught him away from their sight. And as they strained their eyes towards heaven to watch his ascent, all at once two men in white garments were standing at their side. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up to heaven? The one who has been taken from you the one who has been taken from you into heaven, this same Jesus will come back in the same fashion, just as you have watched him going into heaven. And then they left the mountain that is called the Mount of Olives, and returned to Jerusalem. This was not far, a Sabbath day journey. The apostles and the women who had been with Jesus met again in the Eucharistic house.